Hitler's Reich Chancellery was at the center of Nazi power, a building that symbolized the regime's ambition for world domination. Das Werk spricht am Ende dann für sich. Jeder Eiserle hat mitgeholfen an einem Baudenkmal, das viele Jahrhunderte überdauern wird und das von unserer Zeit zeugen wird. Das erste Bauwerk des neuen Großdeutschen Reiches. Here, Hitler planned the war. And here, six years later, in a bunker buried deep beneath the ground, he committed suicide. The new Reich Chancellery was built to last eternity. But at the end of the war, it was destroyed and eradicated. Its story embodies the final years of the Third Reich. This area was once the center of the German capital, Berlin, between the Holocaust Memorial and Potsdamer Platz. It's from here that the German Reich was ruled for decades. Today, you would hardly guess that where these bleak East German apartment blocks now stand was once the power hub of Adolf Hitler. This was the site of the new Reich Chancellery, a palace designed by Hitler's private architect, Albert Speer, and tailor-made for the Führer. Hitler said, as Reich Chancellor in this building, I'm the equal of any emperor, any ruler. The building was monumental, rectangular, and hard-edged. There was a lot of stone, no ornamentation, and little color. It was designed to make people feel like ants. Architecture used to create a backdrop for ruthless, calculating, brutal power. It was a stage set, the stage for a Führer who set out to conquer the world. The new Reich Chancellery was the nerve center of the Nazi regime. Here, Hitler celebrated his triumphs and put an end to his life with a pistol shot. Today, hordes of tourists come to this site looking for an historic landmark, of which nothing remains to be seen. Only an information board or two mark the site of the Chancellery and Hitler's infamous bunker. That was the dark side of power, the months in the cellar. There he gave parties, played with his dog Blondie, and carried on trying to destroy the world. This was where the monster lived. I think that's the fascination. After the war, eager to forget the fascist past, East German planners built over the site as though the Reich Chancellery had never existed. These days, the courtyard where all the dignitaries drove in and where the Arno Brecker statues stood is a kindergarten. The remains of the main bunker where Adolf Hitler shot himself, are still there beneath a car park. But until 2006, there was no information about it at the site. So travel guides came up with the strangest stories. Idiotic tales about Hitler escaping to the Antarctic in a nuclear submarine and similar rubbish. These are all rumors attached to the history of the Führer Bunker. The destruction of the building and the bunker beneath it has allowed the Chancellery to become the focus of myths and wild theories. The site intrigues both professional and amateur historians and others 
like computer graphics expert Christoph Neubauer. He's been fascinated by the Reich Chancellery for a decade. During that time, he's reconstructed the historic site millimeter by millimeter, recreating the building in virtual reality. When I look down Wilhelmstrasse, what I actually see are the old buildings. I'm wondering, what was on this exact spot? Was this the entrance? Was the gate here? Is this the place where Hitler was driven into the ceremonial courtyard? It's no easy task to reconstruct every last detail of the huge building that stood over 400 meters long and 22 meters high. Neubauer has encountered plenty of problems. There's all sorts of data about ceiling thickness, architectural features and so on, but I soon realized I'd have to ditch all of that and start from scratch. Neubauer has analyzed more than 20,000 photographs, drawings and old building plans. In the meantime, a few months has turned into years of painstaking detective work. It's an attempt to understand the building. On the 30th of January, 1933, Hitler was named Chancellor of Germany. When he moved into the Old Reich Chancellery, he claimed that no power in the world will get me out of here alive. He acknowledged the jubilation of his supporters from a badly lit window. Poor propaganda from a man constantly concerned with his public image. The old Reich Chancellery was located in Wilhelmstrasse. Just five years earlier, it had been massively expanded by the addition of an annex. But it was still much too small for Hitler's tastes. He despised everything that represented the democratic spirit of the Weimar Republic. And the stripped down simplicity of his new office fell far short of what he expected in his role as the head of the German government. It was not at all what Hitler envisaged, so he rejected this building from the outset. At best, he thought it could be the headquarters of a soap manufacturer. Behind the facade of the old chancellery, Hitler had already decided to remodel everything to meet his requirements. The first exterior change was the addition of a balcony. From 1935 onwards, Hitler could finally pose for his people in a style befitting a conquering hero. The interesting thing is that from then on, every official or public building that took itself seriously came with a balcony. Why? Because it gave it the aura of a building where the Führer might appear. He furnished the interior of the old chancellery, which had been the center of German government since 1875, with symbols of the new age. On the garden side of the building, he added a large and impressive reception room. was not publicly known at the time was that underneath this room, a bomb-proof air raid shelter was constructed. Its existence was a state secret. It wasn't built because there was any great danger of war at the time, but because those in power in the Third Reich knew that war was coming, because that was what they intended. They were already planning it. The changes made to the old chancellery were not enough for Hitler. He was thinking on a much larger scale. Albert Speer, still in the background here, was the architect Hitler chose to translate his power and greatness into stone.
Hitler himself sketched a ground plan for the new chancellery in 1935. The new building was to be several hundred meters bigger than the old center of power. He wanted long halls. He wanted a reception hall. He wanted an office. He wasn't interested in anything else, just in his own grandeur. Speer was personally appointed by Hitler as general building inspector to fulfill the Führer's desire for a monument to Nazi power. Speer always strove to instinctively understand the wishes of his Führer and go just one better. If Hitler called for 100 meters, Speer would come back with 120 meters, saying, look, I've made it a little bigger, always wanting a pat on the back. The old Vostrasse, a road off Wilhelmstrasse. Hitler had originally planned to rebuild half the street. Speer wanted the whole of it. All the buildings on the right-hand side would have to give way to the new Reich Chancellery. Speer planned an enormously long palace-like complex, but he wasn't sure his drawings would have the desired effect on Hitler. So he decided to construct models. Albert Speer made use of film industry techniques. He adopted the industry set building methods for his models. It was an insane outlay of resources. Full size models were constructed on site so they could quickly see what needed to be altered and if the proportions were right. Speer was confident in his designs. In 1938, work began on the actual building. The completion date was originally set for 1940, but this already tight schedule was further cut once Hitler's secret plans for war became concrete. The building's new inauguration date was January 1939. In March 1938, from his balcony on Wilhelmplatz, Hitler bathed in the jubilation of the crowd at the annexation of Austria. 50 meters behind him, work was already proceeding at full speed on his new residence. Four and a half thousand construction workers were kept busy around the clock. Materials were brought to the huge building site from all around the country. Money was no object, speed was everything. By August 1938, the shell of the building was complete. Hitler attended the topping out ceremony. Das ist jetzt, meine Volksgenossen, kein amerikanisches Tempo mehr, das ist jetzt schon das deutsche Tempo. In January 1939, Hitler and his architect Albert Speer inspected the first building of the Greater German Reich. Work was still ongoing and there was a lot to be done, but the propaganda machine was already rhapsodizing about the Fuhrer's new chancellery and boasting about the speed of German construction. The Reich's Hauptstadt has, after the will of the Führer, a new representative Großbau erhalten. Nach einer Bauzeit von neun Monaten ist jetzt die neue Reichskanzlei fertiggestellt worden. According to the propaganda, Speer had carried out the planning, logistics and construction work in just nine months. But this was a myth. In reality, planning had begun as far back as 1936. Man wollte ja die Entschlossenheit und die they wanted to express the determination and formidable nature and power of the new regime. And of course, a normal brisk building time would not have done that. A New Year reception was held on the 12th of January as planned. 
It was the first test for a building designed to intimidate and overawe. From the courtyard, visitors entered a series of enormous rooms. Every step increases the expectation you have of the person you're going to meet. It's architecture designed to overwhelm. You are made to feel small and are overcome by the greatness and charisma of the other person. In the Mosaic Hall, visitors found themselves in a room 46 meters long and 16 meters high, surrounded by cold, red, polished stone. They built long rooms in a bid to achieve a sort of tunnel effect. At some point on the long walk to the Führer, your feet would start to ache. The Hall of Mirrors was twice the length of its namesake in Versailles, reflecting Hitler's obsession with obliterating Germany's humiliation in the 1919 treaty signed there. Before you reach Hitler's cavernous office, you've walked 250 meters past all this pomp and magnificence. Then comes the emotional release, the climax, so to speak. Eureka, when you finally arrive in his room. The door was five meters high. Incredibly tall entrance passages and the massive impact of the architraves mean you almost have to cower mentally to go in. And that's the desired effect, the abasement of those who have to negotiate these contrivances. Hitler's office covered 400 square meters. Everything was oversized, including the windows, furniture, and a carpet with a swastika pattern. On the wall was a painting of the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. There was a specially made globe. It really was much bigger than a standard globe. Or the map table, where you could spread out the whole world in maps. None of it was actually intended for work purposes, but as a stage set for a performance. How I conquer the world. The focus of the room was the colossal desk. It was three and a half meters long and decorated with a depiction of Mars, the god of war. I don't think there's a single picture of Hitler sitting behind his desk. That would have made the discrepancy between the outsized piece of furniture and Hitler all too obvious. Ironically, the Führer's delusions of grandeur made him look small. A propaganda film entitled The Word Made Stone shows the new Reich Chancellery in all its sterile splendor. The rooms are empty of people. It is pure architecture designed to advance the power of the state. The completion of the building was also celebrated in an opulent book about the new Reich Chancellery. The text speaks of the will towards the supranormal, the august, the courage for existence reaching beyond the self. These images show the garden side of the new building. It was a palace designed for a powerful ruler, a temple to National Socialism. The columns in front of Hitler's office have been given gilded capitals. But behind the scenes, the building's shortcomings were rife. In practical terms, Speer's architecture was a failure. The real task of an architect was not accomplished at all. So intoxicated were they by stage managing the interior and the exterior that they neglected the actual function of the building. 
The Chancellery was supposed to be an administration building, housing the offices of a host of important civil servants. There were gigantic, grandiose entrances that led nowhere. Pure stage setting, with two soldiers standing guard. The ground plan shows you'd come up against a wall. They suggest a depth that simply wasn't there. Such practical details didn't bother Hitler. He saw himself in future not only as ruler of the world, but also as the greatest architect of all time. Before long, he was announcing plans for a new New Reich Chancellery. It was to be part of the world capital Germania, his vision for Berlin after victory in the war. Together with Speer, Hitler began to design buildings for the period after the great military campaigns. But first, Germany had to win the war. Inside the new Reich Chancellery, everything was focused on this purpose. Marshall's batons were laid out on the oversized map table for the victorious military leaders. Hitler was at the pinnacle of his power. With the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, everyone and everything was thrown into the war effort. The propaganda campaign for mobilizing all resources for the front even extended to the Reich Chancellery itself. Auch in der neuen Reichskanzlei werden Wandbeleuchtungen, Kronleuchter und Kaminverkleidungen abgenommen, die ebenfalls der Metallspende zugeführt werden. Die gesammelten Gegenstände werden mit Lastwagen zu den Stadthäfen gefahren. Von dort aus gelangen sie auf dem Wasserwege zu den großen Hüttenwerken. After Germany's initial victories on the Eastern Front, the shadows of war began to reach the new Reich Chancellery. Ever more often, Hitler had to commemorate his fallen generals in the cathedral-like gloom of the Mosaic Hall. And ever more rarely did the standard fly to show that Hitler was in residence. He was seldom in Berlin in the last years. It was a vast, empty building that was somehow maintained and heated, so it would be ready quickly when he did turn up. After launching the Russian campaign in 1941, Hitler spent most of his time in his headquarters in East Prussia, or high up in the Alps at the Berghof, his mountain retreat in the company of Ava Brown who'd been at his side since 1936. She liked to make home movies. Hitler with a magnifying glass. Hitler with Albert Speer. Hitler with his Alsatian Blondie. Surprisingly, there's no footage like this from the new Reich Chancellery, although Ava Brown also lived there with Hitler. Only these images of the victory celebration of 1940 remain. As Hitler turns into the courtyard of the Reich Chancellery, there, captured by the newsreel camera, but hardly recognizable, is Ava Brown with her camera at the window. But Hitler's private life in the Reich Chancellery remains a mystery. By 1943, Allied bombers were appearing over Berlin ever more frequently, loaded with a completely new generation of bombs. Immediately afterwards, Adolf Hitler, who was at his wolf's lair in East Prussia, ordered a new Führer bunker to be built, capable of withstanding these new heavy caliber bombs. The task was given absolute priority. The new Führer bunker was to be built in the garden of the Reich Chancellery. Buried more than eight meters under the ground, it was a rabbit warren of steel and concrete alongside the existing bunker. It had the same floor area, but it was deeper and safer. The reinforced concrete roof was four meters thick. It took till autumn 1944 for the concrete to set. All that was visible above ground was a block covering the emergency exit into the garden. 
diese Bunkerräume. These bunker rooms were tiny compared with the dimensions Adolf Hitler was used to working in. Sind reine Funktionsbauten. They were purely functional. They were very small rooms, rarely bigger than 10 or 12 square meters. They were oppressively cramped. Hitler's bunker world. Office, bedroom, dressing room, and bathroom. No pomp, no ostentation, no globe. It was a different kind of intimidation architecture, this time oppressing the man in charge. It was no longer about impressing the world. It was simply a question of holding out as long as possible. Nothing more. The enemy was closing in. In January 1945, the Red Army was only 60 miles from Berlin. The assault on the capital of the German Reich began. Hitler took charge of the battle for the city. He arrived in Berlin on the 16th of January and resolved to hold out in the Reich Chancellery. Two days after his arrival, Hitler's last reserves were mustered in front of the building. Ich on the 18th of January, I was in Wilhelmplatz, just under 15 years old, in the Volkssturm, home guard. On that day, when nearly everything was over and lost, Goebbels made a speech. Our walls may break, but not our hearts. It's unbelievable from today's perspective. He called on all of us to defend the Reich capital, to the last drop of blood. Two months later, the young conscript witnessed Hitler's last official appearance on the garden side of the Reich Chancellery. I'd been deployed in the government district. Then everything was cordoned off, and we were told that the Führer was coming. Something was happening. So from a distance, I witnessed Hitler's last appearance above ground. Afterwards, the visibly afflicted Führer returned to his concrete warren, to which he'd withdrawn with Ava Brown in early March. On the 20th of April, the Red Army reached the outskirts of Berlin. The Reich Chancellery was now within range of the Soviet artillery. The rumble of gunfire provided the accompaniment to the Führer's 56th birthday. It was the final celebration and his last official engagement. The visitor's book was opened one more time. Long believed to be lost, this book, which had been meticulously kept since January 1939, records the final visitor as being the ambassador of Thailand on the 20th of April, 1945. This is the last photograph of Hitler. Opinion is divided as to where exactly it was taken in the Reich Chancellery. There's a great probability. It's highly likely that he emerged from the deep bunker, climbed the stairs into the old bunker, and went upstairs into his apartment, into the dining room. We know that the penultimate picture was taken there because the furniture in the background has been identified. So the next picture would have been taken nearby at the entrance to the conservatory. That's my assumption at the moment. By now, the fate of the Third Reich was sealed. The man who'd set out to conquer the world was trapped in his bunker eight meters below the ground. On the 29th of April, Hitler and Eva Braun were married in their underground dungeon. The next day, they both took their own lives there. On the 2nd of May, General Weidling, the combat commander for Berlin, capitulated. Shortly before, his staff had taken refuge in the cellars of the new Reich Chancellery. The building was no longer a center of power. It was a broken stone shell. Soviet soldiers soon occupied the former government offices. 
The entrance was overwhelming to look at. It seemed like a 10-story building. As a human, you felt like a little insect in front of it. The columns were huge and imposing. When I entered Hitler's office, the size of it bowled me over. The distance from the door to the outside wall looked like it was nearly 50 meters. There was a vast desk, like a soccer pitch, and in the back corner was a huge globe. I went over to it to see the distance from Stalingrad to Berlin, my journey. The victorious Russians enjoyed their triumph over Hitler. At the same time, our Secret Service was on the spot, searching for Hitler. Two days later, in a bomb crater next to the bunker, a search party came across charred human remains. The corpse of a man, a woman, and a dog. After a post-mortem, forensic specialists were certain they'd identified Adolf Hitler. Stalin was immediately informed, but wary of believing his old nemesis was dead, he kept this confirmation a secret. This left scope for wild speculation. The New York Times published wanted pictures of Adolf Hitler, wearing various wigs, without a mustache, with different mustaches, with a beard, to show what Hitler might look like now. American President Harry Truman came to inspect the place where the great dictator had met his end. But Stalin himself never visited the Reich Chancellery. His reasons remain a mystery to this day. His closest associates did visit the site. Molotov, who'd been there once before in 1940, and secret police chief, Beria. Despite all the evidence confirming Hitler's death, Stalin remained skeptical. Hitler had already deceived him once when he broke the non-aggression pact in 1941. In 1946, a year after the Soviet specialists had made a full report into the evidence, the ruins of the Reich Chancellery were examined again. Under the codename Operation Myth, the site was mapped out and photographed by the Soviet Secret Service. The grounds were carefully combed again for new evidence. With some success. In the bomb crater, where the remains of Hitler and Eva Braun had been found, another piece of Hitler's skull was discovered with a gunshot wound in it. The skull was placed in a Moscow archive. But was Hitler's fate to remain a state secret? The bullet hole could have cleared up the question of how Hitler had died once and for all. But the gunshot wound contradicted Soviet propaganda that claimed Hitler had been too cowardly to shoot himself. Right up to the end of the Soviet era, the Moscow line was that Hitler had died from poison. Today, there remains some doubt whether the skull is actually Hitler's. But Soviet archives contain more proof of his bloody end. This is part of the sofa on which Hitler and his mistress died. And this album of photographs was specially prepared for Stalin in 1946. The pictures were taken to help persuade Stalin that Hitler was dead. But some doubts remained. After the end of the Second World War, the former center of Nazi power in the heart of Berlin gradually lost its horror, but not its fascination. 
With the occupation of the city by the Allies, the first wave of post-war sightseeing got underway amidst a wasteland of rubble. This is rare color footage taken by American soldiers. The ruins of the new Reich Chancellery, once the embodiment of Nazi ideals, had a magnetic attraction for the new visitors. Meanwhile, the architect of the intimidating structure, Albert Speer, was being tried for war crimes in Nuremberg. He escaped with his life. On his way to prison in Berlin, he was able to look down from the plane on his work. It lay in ruins, but was still identifiable. The Reich Chancellery was in the Soviet-occupied sector, and the Russians liked neither the buildings nor the Hitler tourism that was starting. They certainly didn't want the site to become a place of pilgrimage for Nazi supporters. It was decided to blow the whole thing up, to prevent the Reich Chancellery from becoming a cult site for devotees of the Nazi regime. By 1947, the Soviets had decided to completely demolish the whole Reich Chancellery. Bit by bit, all traces of the building above ground disappeared. It left behind a mountain of debris. Some building materials, like bricks and floor slabs, were carted away for reuse. For years, it was rumored that the stone used in the underground station on the former Wilhelmplatz, which was reopened in 1950, had come from the remains of the new Reich Chancellery. This is just a legend, according to many experts. But others are convinced that this was indeed what the East German powers of the time decided. By 1950, Speer's opulent edifice had finally disappeared from the Berlin cityscape. But the concrete remains of the Führer bunker proved invincible. All attempts to blow it up failed. In the end, what was left of the bunker was simply buried. When the Berlin Wall went up in 1961, the site of Hitler's Reich Chancellery disappeared into the death strip of no man's land. The entire area became off limits, shrouded in legend behind a barrier of barbed wire and concrete. For a long time, no one was interested in the Reich Chancellery. In 1968, West Berlin newspapers began reporting that there were underground tunnels beneath the Tiergarten Park, which was true. And maybe there were also links to East Berlin, which was just a few hundred meters away. The East German State Security Ministry immediately set up a high-level commission to investigate the underground installations. The Stasi dug up the whole section of the border, exposing most of the extensive complex of bunkers and tunnels. In the process, fragments of Goebbels' diaries were discovered. These didn't interest the Stasi particularly. What was important to them was that there were no escape tunnels from East Berlin. In the 1980s, the problem of the bunker complex on the border resurfaced. In 1984, 
the East German government decided to improve the Berlin Wall and block the view from East into West Berlin as much as possible. A major new residential area was to be built on Wilhelmstrasse. The Stasi were even prepared to reduce the width of the death strip at this point. Rumors then sprang up in East Berlin that the work had uncovered Nazi buildings. In May 1988, an East Berlin artist, Erhard Schreier, heard about the underground buildings and wanted to find out what was going on. A group of five or six construction workers were standing talking, so I went over to them. They were a bit suspicious at first because they didn't know who I was, and we were in the prohibited zone, with the death strip just beyond. Then one of them took me aside and said, we're blowing up Adolf's bunker. I said, Adolf's bunker? Where? I can't see anything. He smiled at me and said, you're standing on it. Schreier decided to make a very dangerous expedition down into the past. He went equipped with a camera, tape measure, and drawing materials. A month earlier, an East Berlin camera crew had managed to film in the underground labyrinth. This is the only remaining footage of Hitler's bunker installation. It was eerie down there, the silence, with just the sound of dripping water. It was unearthly somehow. And always this drip, 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 drip. That was the only sound, dripping. The only sign of life in this sarcophagus. For five months in 1988, Erhard Schreier was able to explore Hitler's bunker. Hundreds of sketches and photographs were the result. These are the last known pictures of the bunker. I saw myself as documenting it, without embellishment. What you see is what was there, a record, just as it was. Schreier also painstakingly recorded the new construction work. By the end of 1988, the bunker, steeped in history and myth, had been demolished and removed. It was replaced by communist flats for several thousand people. The terrible deeds done in this place were hidden, suppressed and forgotten. But with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the site was suddenly at the heart of the city again. Now, journalists and historians were free to investigate an area that had been forbidden territory for nearly 30 years. This footage shows the remains of the driver's bunker in the Chancellery Motorpool. History just jumped out at you. It took your breath away. It really took my breath away because it was suddenly so real, so direct. A heated debate broke out about what should happen to the bunker remains. Should they be open to the public? Would this encourage a flood of Hitler tourists? Should they be cleared away like the rest of the Reich Chancellery? Or should a memorial be created? In the end, the bunker was sealed up. Piece by piece, the site was built on. The last traces of Hitler's palace have disappeared. The devil's seed was planted there. Now we just have a mix of prefabricated flats, sausage stands, souvenir shops and so on. It's become an international circus. 
Apart from a few information boards, the new Reich Chancellery, once the power center of National Socialism, has been swallowed up by the Berlin cityscape. A fitting end for a monument built by a megalomaniac who wanted it to stand for centuries.